Okay, so we are live now with the online. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, our next speaker is Paul Krause with Health for Life Counseling in Grand Rapids. And Paul has a couple locations in Grand Rapids and I think probably close to 30 therapists now. Paul? Uh, yeah, okay. I think we're getting up there. Okay, and, and you know, they, they specialize in all different types of trauma and different ways of treating trauma, like somatic experiencing, EMDR, and so on. So Paul is going to talk to you about the different methods that they use for trauma and also, you know, where we can, again, uh, in following the theme of this day, is how family engagement can help or and sometimes hinder. <laughs> but um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Paul. Thanks. All right, thank you, Shannon, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, the presentation I'm gonna give you is called Family Engagement for Sustainable Recovery When Dealing with Trauma and the After Effects of Trauma. And uh, I'm gonna encourage you to try to stay with this. Uh, many of you may have already taken a lot of classes and courses on trauma. So I am gonna talk a little bit about trauma from how it's deepened my understanding over the years. And I'm gonna to try to present that kind of in the first half and talk a lot about the evidence for what trauma is and different types of trauma. And it's a little dark, I'm not gonna lie. So uh, then in the second part, I'm gonna really work on what clinicians can be doing, what mental health agencies can be doing, um, what can people do that aren't clinicians uh, in their communities? Uh, what can we do to help uh, people that are survivors of trauma or are currently being impacted by environmental trauma? So that's basically the aim of this. So I'm going to skip over a few of the slides that talk about the objectives and whatnot, but I am going to give Shannon a Google Drive um, file so you can actually have all these slides in PDF form later. So if you are the type that wants to really absorb and get into this, you don't have to take notes unless something really springs out at you because you can get these slides later. So uh, as Shannon said, um, just so we have you know, who I am. So I'm Paul Krause, and I've been uh, in the field of mental health as a licensed person since 2007. Um, and I'm the clinical director of Health for Life Counseling. And part of our Health for Life Counseling is the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids. We have two locations right now. Um, I host a podcast, and I'm an EMDRIA-approved consultant for EMDR therapy. And I do counseling supervision and other things like that. So you can learn more about me later. That's me. You can see me on the screen though. So I'm not going to bore you with reading all of this, but you can basically see that I want to talk about trauma first and then how that affects people and what environmental trauma is and what we need to be looking for as clinicians. Um, so essentially, I'm also going to get into the differences between stress and trauma and the concepts at the end of sustainable recovery and post-traumatic growth. So obviously, if you're not, if you haven't learned a lot about trauma, this is going to be a little heavy on that at the beginning. But I really think that even if that's not the focus of your practice, you can really learn a lot about what we've learned about trauma over the last 20 years and start incorporating that in your practice or in your agency no matter what your lens is, it can just broaden it and give you new language. So a big point of this is, is that um, I went to graduate school in 2005 to 2007, and there was not even much classroom time devoted except to possibly post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, we didn't really understand what trauma-informed paradigm was. We didn't really understand what all that was. And so there's been a lot of research. It started before I went to grad school, but it really hasn't even started getting into the curriculum as far as I know until the last five to seven years in a lot of graduate schools. So um, I believe it actually helps us understand the human condition more, uh, the way symptoms origi originate and where they come from. So all the symptoms in the DSM-5 TR that you might uh, see, a lot of those can be traced back to trauma. Obviously, some of them are from biological uh, origins, but also stress is one measurable we see in the medical community. And prolonged toxic chronic stress can be a form of environmental trauma that can also influence genetic predispositions to um, all the mental disorders you can find to begin to come out in the person. Um, we're going to talk about how life experiences, they influence every part of the person. And 
we define them as trauma, which we'll be getting into that definition in a moment, but they, they influence every part of the person that you see in your clinic or in your community, the, the way they adapt to things in the, in the positive or negative way, uh, the way they think about the world and themselves, the way they behave, uh, both in the community and alone. And, and it, as we can see from the studies that I'll present, also physical health and more factors. Um, I believe it's important to really pay attention to this beginning part, because while a lot of us have been to trauma seminars, and so have I, I've tried to incorporate a bunch of definitions and reasons um, so that you can see a broad spectrum of what the uh, people that study this are, are saying. And it's very important. Um, a lot of people talk about the mind body paradigm. We're trying to bring, you know, mental health together with physical health and becoming more experiential in therapy and not just focusing on the frontal lobe of logic as our main uh, key intervention in therapy. And so if you want to know about that, it's very important to understand what trauma is. And then of course, integrated care, um, which is huge for family engagement and sustainable recovery from mental illnesses which you will see here. So I'm going to just skip that. So there are multiple definitions of trauma. And here's one of them I'm just going to read from uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Organization of America, which is trauma results from this event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, and emotional or spiritual well-being. And so you see that's quite a broad definition, but it's a sense, um, it's a way that people react to things. And what you'll see as we draw this out is it's not just them reacting in the moment. There's that initial possible trauma, right? But it's how this trauma gets encoded in the nervous system that actually is what we usually see later on in the therapy room and that people in these people's lives that have been through major traumas will see uh, in that person's behavior and in their thinking. So many individuals report a single traumatic event, uh, especially those seeking for uh, services for mental health or substance abuse. Uh, but you know, the people that are really seeking coming in our door, a lot of them have exposed to multiple or chronic trauma over the years. And that it builds up in the system and, and lots of issues come out of that. And there's a lot of, I think, because we only have a very few trauma diagnoses in the DSM uh, 5 TR, mostly post-traumatic stress disorder and some other ones that can be tied to it, oftentimes people um, come into our clinics and get labeled with some sort of long lasting label like bipolar or major depression. And while they still probably have those symptoms that meet the criteria, um, that sometimes people don't understand that when you get diagnosed with a mental disorder, it's often a state of being. It's, a, it's for a time. It's, it's what you're presenting with now in the clinician's office, in the psychiatrist's office. It doesn't mean that you now have this disease that will always be there, right, uh, in, under all circumstances or, you know, because... For instance, if somebody's diagnosed with cancer, we can see that there's the cancer, we can see where it's spreading, we can see where the growth is, and we can try to target it with chemotherapy, and we can try to help the body with other alternative therapies to help them deal with the effects of chemo and other you know, surgeries. But with mental illness, um, oftentimes people feel labeled and they carry that label. Um, and without a good explanation of why they became majorly depressed and understanding how to become not majorly depressed or substance dependent, uh, people, they can be lost in the system essentially and label themselves. So um, does anyone in the crowd want to share a trauma that they have heard about that a person experienced that they believe influenced that person years after the event itself? Anybody out there? I'm not sure if the crowd can participate. Okay, I can't really hear anybody out there. I, it, oh, okay. Because I, ha I have a backup example just in case. But Can you hear me? Yes. I have a patient right now who came in. Um, he, his father committed suicide on his birthday. 
and he found him and then his mother committed suicide four months later and he was left to um, basically kind of clean up the family. So, wow. yeah. <laughs> and then that's still affecting him years later, I'm assuming. Well, this is, it was fairly recent. Oh, okay. But it was like a couple years ago, I think. Right. Yeah. So, well, yes, but yes, very much so. Well, that's very good that he's able to get treatment access that soon, um, hopefully. And hopefully with um, working with you, and other people in the community and natural supports, he can work on reassembling his life and hopefully his nervous system and mind can can adapt to this circumstance because that's a pretty that's a very major that's double trauma in multiple ways. Uh, big they call it the big T trauma, and then also loss of a support system. Then he's left with responsibilities of cleaning up the family. That's another one. There's possibly loss of meaning. If your parents kill themselves, what does that mean about you? What does that mean about your family? What does that mean about the DNA you share? Um, possible spiritual trauma, like what does this mean existentially in the world if your parents die? All sorts of things can come up with this. Um, so I'm glad that he's seeing you. So that is a good example. Um, let's see, we have an example in the chat. Uh, somebody says, being in foster care, uh, the mother was a substance use addict and would make the client, their client have sex with dealers for the mother to get drugs. And the client was in elementary school. Okay. Yeah. That's very bad because that's a, multiple traumas at once um, with the client. First of all, having sex as minor with uh, adults that may not be friendly. That's bad. Obviously, rape, I guess we, we could call that, categorize that as rape, um, also, and human trafficking, uh, essentially also being a child, also the mother she's trusting uh, is now, you know, using her in a way, um, and that so she has the caretaker trauma, she's got the rape, human trafficking trauma, and the fact that she's a minor, so she's her brain is still developing her sense of safety in the world and who's safe and who's not, so this can alter people's entire life. And then it's no wonder that um, somebody might present later on with depression or anxiety. So thank you both for your examples. Um, this is the dark part I was talking about. So um, another thing, I'm, so I'm glad that people seem to understand uh, from those examples, what are, what are some traumas? So we're going to get into that. I want to just make sure that we get another definition. I, I liked this definition, which was um, psychological trauma is an affliction of the powerless. At the moment of trauma, the victim is rendered helpless by an overwhelming force. When the force is that of nature, we speak of disasters. So uh, the hurricane in Houston a few years ago that flooded all, everyone's homes and some people died, but other people just lost their entire um, belongings and place to live. When the force is that of other human beings, we speak of atrocities. So obviously human trafficking and you know uh, somebody committing suicide in your family is an atrocity. Traumatic events overwhelm the ordinary systems of care that give people a sense of control, connection, and meaning. And that's huge because as you know from uh, your psychology classes, humans are very big into being creatures of meaning. And if they have meaning, they can very much endure terrible circumstances. I mean, you hear about, if any of you have read Man's Search for Meaning on Viktor Frankl uh, being in the concentration camp in, uh, when in, during World War II, the fact that he didn't roll over and die and that moment when the uh, Nazi guard was going to shoot him in the head and he was in the snow bleeding um, and told him to get up and he didn't feel like he had strength is because he thought one day he had a vision of him talking and healing uh, large numbers of people and he eventually did. So in those situations, if we have a, a sense of meaning, we can withstand a lot of adversity. But when trauma happens to some people and especially young people, um, you, they're so overwhelmed that it splits so many of their concepts of what it means to be a person in the world. Everything crashes at once. And that is overwhelming and thus the lasting effect. So uh, another definition of trauma. A more recent uh, use of the word trauma is a psychological damage from external events that do not necessarily involve physical harm. So a lot of times in the PTSD diagnosis, which I'm not going to get into the weeds on that but a lot of it was from either witnessing or experiencing directly physical uh, harm like um a, a lot of people i've treated 
about 10 years ago when I was living in Arizona full time were uh, military veterans. And a lot of them had been in the war in Afghanistan and Iraq and had seen their friends get blown up and in some cases had uh, sustained uh, traumatic brain injuries from um, being in a tank that was hit with a, uh, um, or they rolled over a mine, or improvised explosive device. And essentially uh, they had the classic PTSD and they, uh, of several of them actually, oddly enough, could not go to 4th of July fireworks shows because they could, they could not stand the sound of explosions. One of them had moved far out of the city, even though he loved the city he lived in. He had moved out to, into the rural area because of the noise. Um, uh, lots of other symptoms occurred. Um, but uh, now we're learning that beyond that, there is, uh, you know, this could just be emotional uh, harm, such as bullying. There's been a big theme of bullying and children committing suicide from being bullied online or in person. So we're, we're learning that it's a lot more about how the body and that person's mind interprets what's happening to them and their, their ability to, to be resilient or not and, and, and the specifics of all of that that cause, uh, can cause lasting trauma. What we're learning now is that from this quote here in Altmeyer in 2019 is that it's not just the physical damage or being around almost dying or being around major threats of, of somebody hurting you. It's the psychological damage that can happen from emotional trauma. So bullying has been a big issue with children being bullied in schools and children having you know, major problems uh, emotionally and actually some of them committing suicide because psychological effects are just as damaging we're learning uh, depending on the person and their circumstance, everything's, you know, obviously depends on the person and depends on their, their natural supports and, and their psychological makeup, but uh, emotional and psychological damage can come from many things that don't involve actually being physically harmed or being near something that hurts you just being in, in the middle of toxic chronic stress, which we'll get to. So of course, a lot of people have heard about Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. His definition of trauma is trauma is not the story of something that happened back then. He says, it's the current imprint of that pain, horror, and fear living inside people. So when trauma is encoded in the nervous system, we will get into that. Uh, for people with, depending on the gradient, let's just pretend there's a gradient of trauma from a low amount of trauma, right, to PTSD over here. Um, in that scenario, certain people, when the trauma gets triggered, it's as if it's currently happening and or it feels psychologically like it's happening. So maybe they won't be ducking for cover under a couch because they heard a loud door slam, but they will have an immediate um, feeling of being helpless or like a child and they can't defend themselves, even maybe to their boss or something at work. So let's go to the differences between trauma and PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, People have often equated the two, but from what I'm talking about in this presentation, a traumatic event is time-based, um, while PTSD is a longer-term condition where one continues to have flashbacks and experiences the traumatic event. Now, however, experiencing serious trauma is a precondition of developing PTSD, and that might be confusing, but what we're saying is that these events are, you know, happen, right? And in PTSD, there's these major symptoms, but there are also minor and medium symptoms for people. And that can turn into anxiety, depression, and other things like that. So that being said, uh, that we are still trying to figure out how do we, it's, instead of everything being called trauma, right? Which, which can be confusing because that's, the word has its own definition. We're talking about the way the information that happened to you what happened to you, the events, the social events, the perceptions, the perceptions of these events are very important. And they depend on the person's personality and their makeup and their and child or their environment it becomes a nervous system disturbance or a nervous system encoding. This disturbance is memorized by the brain remapped. And why is it doing that? Why is the brain doing that? It's doing that to protect you. Your brain wants to keep you alive. And so your brain is going to react to any stimuli that remind it of any earlier disturbance. And thus, people 
you know, you, you, you ever had a friend tell you you're overreacting or a family member that says you're too sensitive? Well, oftentimes, um, some people, you know, show their upset feelings about certain things that come up that remind them of a possible trauma or something where other people mask those symptoms and they don't want to show their emotions because that can be just uh, in cultural settings in our country can be perceived as weakness to show emotion in some circles. Um, and so this disturbance is mapped and remapped by your brain, but that effect orients you and it reorients you in ways that can cause further suffering, such as the narrative in your mind can lead you to depression. Um, your ability to calm yourself can kind of leave you. People have trouble sleeping. They have trouble feeling relaxed. Um, uh, people need something to calm themselves. So what's an easy way to calm yourself, but downing a beer immediately or smoking marijuana or using opiates or, or other drugs that can help you ability, uh, to calm yourself because you don't know how to calm yourself. Um, if, you, if you can't regulate your emotions, that can lead to a personality disorder where you try to regulate yourself by controlling everyone around you and uh, the environment and really annoying everybody, right? Or being super anxious because I, I, I don't know how to feel good inside. So now I'm, I'm worried about everything out here, right? And I'm worried about myself inside as well. And that can affect your ability to be involved in healthy relationships and so much more and work performance and all of this. Um, so oftentimes when I have clients who have a lot of chronic trauma, they have a lot of difficulties being in relationships with other people. And that's very difficult for them. And they then label themselves as I'm a failure. So um, here's some examples of trauma in children. I'm not going to go over all of these. But these are just some things that, that these are not all the things, but these are just some things I was looking at. Um, about things that can happen to children um, and that that can cause long lasting trauma. And as you can see here, some of these are like intimate partner violence that's happening to their to their parent, right? Um, and not even to them. So um, when a child feels intensely threatened by an event, they are involved in a witness, we can also call that a trauma, right? This encoding in the nervous system. And if it, it depends um, on the type of what happens to, to the child and their perceptions, but it could become lingering later on. And a lot of children, because they're growing up and their brains are developing, they don't even realize why they react the way they do, right? So, so there are some at-risk populations. This is um, just talking a little bit about what's going on here. But um, some groups are... are disproportionately represented among those experiencing trauma, which means they may be exposed to trauma at a particularly high rate or having increased risk for repeated victimization. And essentially, there's a strong correlation um, with people that use substance abuse and continue trauma from using. So it's like, I had a trauma, I feel terrible, I start using substances. And this could, you know, this, we talk about drugs and alcohol, but let's talk about food for a moment. How many people overeat because they, it calms them down to have those carbohydrates and those sugars, right? It, it makes them feel better to eat the ice cream or whatever it is or the donut. And then how many people, you know, with anxiety, how many young people are restricting and having eating disorders because it's the one thing they can control, right? But with trauma and substance use, I start using a substance or a food and I'm overdoing it because I want to feel better and I want to dissociate from what happened to me. But then because I'm doing that, with the drug and alcohol, I could become addicted. And then I have continued re-victimization from there. Um, and with the food, then I'm labeled as I'm too large. Um, people make fun of me. Um, I'm, I'm then labeled there from on, on out. Um, and then I have health problems. Um, and then with, of course, restricting, that's obviously health problems in another way from being too small and organ damage. Economic stress in families are huge. Families whose parents are upset about paying the bills, who are worried about housing. You know, we go back to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs and food and shelter and safety. If you don't have food and shelter, how can you feel safe? And therefore, the nervous system of somebody experiencing economic stress can get really programmed. Military and veteran families, we already kind of talked about that. Homeless youth, clearly huge. They don't feel safe. They had to leave their home for some reason. And now they're at risk for re-victimization and or getting involved in criminal activity and other things because um, they're easily exploited. LGBTQ youth, they, um, you know, a lot of 
uh, youth feel that they are not accepted by their families or their church or their community or their town, and they have to leave home or they just have to hide, and they can be particularly traumatized and uh, victimized. Uh, children growing up in neighborhoods or attending schools with inadequate or sparse resources are more likely to be at risk for obvious reasons. And we'll get into that because we're going to talk about the positive side of community later. Children living in neighborhoods with systemic violence where toxic stress is prevalent. Um, this is having an effect on the nervous system, which is going to have effect on their behavior. These children go to schools, they get labeled as problem children, they're always interrupting, they can't concentrate, maybe they get labeled as ADHD, um, maybe they get labeled as ODD. And really, it's coming back to emotional regulation and safety at home. And the hard part is we don't have the resources often to help them. Um, I, I like Dr. Vander Kolk's definition here, ongoing damage to the whole of living. It affects every part of you. Um, it's a fundamental reorganization of the way the mind and body manages perceptions. Um, not only the way we think, but the way what we think about our very capacity to think. The act of telling the story doesn't necessarily alter the automatic physical and hormonal responses that remain hypervigilant. But I'm going to skip that part. But for real change to take place, the body needs to learn that the danger has passed and to live in the reality of the present. And that's difficult for children living in these neighborhoods or um, at-risk people because the danger has not passed, right? And so then how do we help them, right? If, if the danger has not passed and they can't get out of it and, and be in a different environment. So I'm going to go a little bit fast through this so we can get to the positive stuff. But just so you know, these are some of the symptoms that are commonly initial reactions to trauma right when it happens, uh, numbness, dissociation, confusion, Severe responses are continued distress with, without periods of relative calm or rest and severe dissociation symptoms and intensive intrusive flashbacks or recollections of trauma or what happened. Uh, delayed responses can happen in some people and uh, they come on later where somebody, I've, I've had people who've had a trauma happen to them and then they didn't, they kind of buried it or dissociated from it for years. And then all of a sudden they have problems sleeping, they have depression, they have anxiety, they're avoiding emotions um, all of, out of nowhere. And then finally, if you work with them, they find out that something was suppressed or buried in them. Um, these are common uh, experiences post-trauma. So people have emotional symptoms, that gets diagnosis, depression, anxiety, adjustment, uh, emotional dysregulation. Often um, this can look like bipolar and um, sort of personality disorders, numbing, um, you know, numbing with drugs, alcohol, or just feeling numb. Physical symptoms, people have, a, there's a lot of people that go to their doctor with chronic pain. And oftentimes this originated possibly with trauma if it wasn't from a physical source. Um, somatization, again, my stomach hurts, I'm worried. Hyper arousal, feeling like you're always guarding. Um, I had a friend who was a veteran and when we, whenever we go out to eat, he would um, refuse to sit anywhere that was not in the back corner of the restaurant so that he could look at the whole restaurant to make sure there wasn't a threat. Uh, later on, I found out he was also carrying a knife and a gun in his pants. And I did not know that until we were out to eat. So he was always looking in the, you know, wherever we were. Sleep disturbances. Um, there's a lot of, you know, literature out right now about Americans having difficulty sleeping for one reason or another. That's an, uh, another experience of post-trauma. Triggers or cues, um, flashbacks, sometimes hallucinations, de delusions. I've heard people on the street with schizophrenia um, telling stories of, you know, that don't seem to make sense. But uh, when I worked with that population for a year, oftentimes over and over, they'd tell the strange, same strange story. And it was sort of twisted. Um, but once I, I worked with a woman for a while, and she kept telling me the same story, which made no sense because it was very metaphorical and involved uh, magical characters and political um, people. But eventually I figured out um, one day after she had gotten her antipsychotic medication, uh, she kind of came out with it and just said, oh, I was raped by five men. And um, I was like, whoa, because it was like she wasn't usually clear. But I think about her, I thought about, oh my gosh, so she was raped, this happened. And the next thing you know, four or five years later, I, whenever she came into treatment with our team, she is having hallucinations, delusions. And um, we uh, nowhere in the notes could I find that this had happened. So even in our intake notes, um, that had never been mentioned. Um, so we did talk about that as a team. Um, 
and try to get her trauma therapy. But again, this was a long time ago and there wasn't really many resources, but we did try. Um, avoidance, you know, if people have had a bad experience, they'll avoid certain places or anything that brings that up. So just going to go through this, just so you know, scientifically, we know that it changes the limbic system. We know it changes the hypothalamic pituitary and adrenal axis. Um, cortisol, which is the stress hormone, rises, so people feel on edge. Um, and it can even cause neurotransmitter-related dysregulation and arousal in the endogenous opiate systems, which can cause all sorts of problems because your neurotransmitters are very important in helping your mood um, become stable. Uh, you know about the classic fight, flight, freeze. So uh, these are some of the ways that we've identified uh, that we can identify in behavior that the sympathetic nervous system is activated. Fight, flight, freeze, fawn, collapse. Fawn is kind of like acquiescing or trying to people please. And collapse is kind of when you just kind of give up and lay down. Um, and these all interact in the studies with cortisol and adrenaline. Um, because our body is, again, trying to help us. It is causing cortisol and adrenaline to rise. So we know that there's a threat. The problem is after the threat is over, the body continues preparing for danger. And these can lead to the symptoms you see in your office. Uh, so again, so the difference between trauma, trauma is an experience of extreme stress or shock that was at some point part of life. Stress is, can be good, right? But stress is a reaction to less dramatic and actual life events such as now, for some people, here's the weird thing. So some people, the job loss, academic exam, failure, deadlines, finances, loss of a friend, divorce can be a trauma. For other people, it can be a stress. That's the hard part. Um, stress can lead us into new opportunities. It can drive innovation. It can, it can work on um, helping us to be prepared for something and to study harder next time and to work on our finances and to find better friends. But for some people, it's a trauma. And that's the difference is that stress, you know, usually comes for a while. And then eventually due to life circumstances, we are a little less stressed for a little while. The trauma um, stays with us. Stress can be good. Uh, as you know, you can't learn anything without stress. If anybody out there has ever practiced an instrument, right, or become tried to uh, learn how to dance or learn how to sing, um, or learned how to paint or draw, you know that you have to practice, right? And that can be stressful and annoying. Uh, because, but the good thing about stress is that it's predictable and controllable. Like I'm going to learn how to run cross country. I need to start running more and more miles every week. And that's stressful to me. Stress can help us develop resilience. So I have this resilience is a, is a big term and there's so much around it. But if I feel capable um, after running and learning how to run, I'm going to start thinking good thoughts about myself. I'm going to start thinking I can overcome these things, right? Um, in life, but unpredictable and extreme stressors, like being in a violent atmosphere or abnormal patterns of activation that can lead to severe problems. So that's not good. Um, that's toxic chronic stress and that can lead to mental illness. And that's a study that shows that not only does toxic chronic stress in a household, um, such as, you know, parents fighting or, you know, food instability or economic issues can lead to mental illness, but it can also lead to risky behaviors and substance use. Uh, it literally can damage the structure and function of a child's developing brain, um, which is just wild. So again, we wonder what is wrong with these people? Their brains are wired different than your brain. And that's something we have to get into the education system and the judicial system. Um, ways to avoid stress transforming into trauma. So these are just some ways that um, we can release it. This is not like a clinical thing here, but re releasing it physically, like crying, screaming, shaking, processing it in therapy or psychologically journaling. Um, if we are fully able to process it, it may not become a trauma. It may be able to become just a stressful event. Depends on what happened. Uh, it needs to, stress needs to be processed. Otherwise the effects will remain in the nervous system and cause psychological symptoms uh, of mental disorders. And essentially if, if too much time goes by, you know, that's why we, when a, when a trauma happens, companies and schools will bring in counselors immediately because for some people that's going to be a trauma, right? But for some people it might become a past stress and a bad memory, not necessarily a trauma in terms of the way the body encodes it, if we're able to process it immediately.
and to have help from others. So I've already said this, but it can't be stressed enough that traumatic stress increases the risk for mental illness. Uh, research suggests that trauma often precedes the development of mental disorders. And this is in so many articles in the last 20 years. It's everywhere. And these are from studies. And childhood trauma correlates with poor health outcomes later in life, such as heart disease and other things like that. So I'm just sort of summarizing this. Uh, we all have a nervous system. We're all mammals. So if you've ever raised animals, uh, especially mammals, they have a similar nervous system. And if you ever have had a dog, um, after a dog is scared, uh, there's two things the dog will do. While it's scared, it will yawn and like this. And then after it's been feel safe again, it'll shake, right? And that shake is, is what they believe, researchers believe, is the mammal's way of shaking off the stress and then getting back into the present moment. Um, we humans are mammals, but we have a larger and more developed brain. We have the ability to reason, tell stories, critically think. But it doesn't mean that we aren't constantly influenced by our autonomic nervous system and its drive to keep us alive. So there's often a conflict with how we feel physically and what our narrative is in our minds. And a lot of you have probably experienced that. Um, so that, and, the, and when, when it is on overdrive, right? And it's trying to protect us too much, then we have these behaviors that actually become maladaptive. So I'm gonna give a little bit about the adverse child experiences study. And it was a study done in the late nineties and it was also done in many other states, but the first one was done in the late nineties to describe the connection between childhood experiences and medical public health problems in the long term. And essentially it was looking at the following factors, disease risk factors, quality of life, healthcare utilization and mortality in the long term of abuse and household dysfunction during childhood. So essentially it's huge. It, it, it expanded our viewpoint of trauma. Uh, the Kaiser Permanent, Permanente and the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, began this study in 1995 in San Diego. 17,000 patients. Uh, in addition to their regular medical history, they were also given the ACEs quiz, which many of you may have taken before or given to clients. And it went over neglect, abuse, family dysfunction, other things like that, sexual abuse, parents who had gone to prison, violence in the household. And the research basically found if there was any of these harmful experiences in childhood, they became correlated and predictive of lifelong problems with health and well being, including negative physical symptoms and outcomes, more likely to suffer from an addiction, and more likely to have severe mental health problems. The more problems reported, the higher the ACE score correlated directly with the likelihood of an individual to encounter severe problems throughout the lifespan, including all of these things that we've listed before. And you know, this was groundbreaking for a number of reasons. We'll get into that in just a moment. So uh, one of the things that was culturally disruptive is that adverse child experiences were exceedingly common, much more than all the researchers had uh, anticipated. In fact, two thirds of participants had, uh, who had undergone the study had at least one ACE and one in five had endured more than three. Uh, this began decades of study in, on the prevalence of damaging effects of trauma. And in fact, it's been uh, replicated in many other states since then. Um, I think 30 something states have done the ACEs study at a clinic or two and have found um, basically the same results. And you can see all that online if you wanna look that up. Um, we have learned in psychotherapy that uh, learning to treat trauma and the roots of things and learning, lurking, uh, learning to prevent additional trauma is important from this. And we've learned, we've started new modalities such as EMDR therapy, somatic experiencing therapy, trauma-focused CBT, which are tailored to address the effects of the precise traumatic events and situations that the person has endured. Hopefully, if you address that, then some of the other symptoms will uh, be alleviated. Uh, it was disruptive to the cultural narrative of the nuclear family and normality in the United States because um, people, you know, they didn't want the family to look bad, essentially but they couldn't believe that this had happened because we'll get to that because a lot of these people were middle-class and white. That's who was in this study. Um, so that the study concluded in 1998 and the, there, this is, you can look up the quiz yourself. 
Um, but this is just a slide for you to see what looks what the questions are, the 10 questions, right? And there's and, and I mean, I'm sure we need to update the A score, but this is what we've got right now. And these are the things that were studied, like physical, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical neglect, mental illness, divorce, violence, mental illness in the family, having a relative who have sent to jail or prison. Um, so I have a relative who is like a second cousin and in his childhood, and he told me this, you know, he's way older than me, probably 20 years older than me. He described physical abuse from his father. He had sexual abuse from a neighbor. His mother was mentally ill. She killed herself later um, when he was 18. Uh, he then was neglected uh, by his father. Uh, but when he tried to go to college, he his whole life had emotional neglect. His Obviously, his mother was mentally ill, but his father was abusive. So probably two mental illnesses. They did not divorce. They both drank. Um, the mother was currently was beaten by the father often in Chicago. And uh, obviously, they were never diagnosed with mental illness, but I would say they did. And he had, uh, his father had gone to jail for something. I don't know what it was. Well, anyway, <laughs> he had about every single one of these. And he had gone to prison himself for stealing. And uh, eventually, when I knew him, he lived in a uh, one of those very fancy camper vans in California in a church parking lot and worked in a factory and did not want to own a home, did not want to have an apartment, did not want to have a partner. He enjoyed living in the church parking lot and the church let him, uh, he sort of was their security guard. The church let him essentially stay there for free and, and he could have food and, and uh, use their shower to kind of watch the place. And he, he was a very interesting character, but he had all of these and it, it, you could see it in his life. He uh, had difficulty with jobs, difficulty with relationships, uh, difficulty following through. At one point, he had used substances for a long time. He smoked cigarettes and um, not good, not good stuff. So uh, essentially, the higher the score, the higher your risk of health and social emotional problems. And as you can see here, here's some statistics on it. And then, oh, 36 states and the District of Columbia have done their own ACE studies, and they are all similar in results. Um, one in six adults have experienced four or more types of ACEs. That's huge. At least five of the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States are associated with your ACE score. Um, more than 60% of adults having uh, have at least one adverse child experiences, and almost 25% report three or more, which is huge. Nearly all of American children have experienced at least one A score, with children of color being the highest risk. So other factors, we've talked about this before, but just there's so many studies, I couldn't stop finding more studies that talked about the health problems related to childhood trauma. Uh, basically, lung cancer, heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune, and also becoming violent or becoming a victim of violence. And there's been about 70 publications uh, since 1998. Um, so I, I was just, you know, this has obviously been proven over and over. So, you know, imagine the implications for this, if, and, and uh, the initial ACE study, you know, a lot of these were done on white upper middle-class people in San Diego, uh, who had good healthcare because actually Kaiser Permanente is one of the best healthcare systems you can buy besides Blue Cross out there. So imagine if we did not do the study. I, I don't know. Some of the studies actually, I think, were later done on, uh, inner, uh, of, on Black, Indigenous, and people of color populations. And I didn't have time to go into all those. But imagine the impact. If it, so if this is happening in your white, middle class, upper class communities that some of you serve, imagine what is, and, and these ACE studies are correlating, and there's so many high scores. Imagine what's going on in the people of color, black indigenous people of color and other marginalized communities who according to statistics in the other part of the presentations are more likely to grow up in communities without access to quality healthcare, education, they have uh, economic stress and a lot of them even lack like health, healthy food options. So we can just, we can kind of extrapolate that a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna, I think I have a lot going on here but essentially you can read more about it but also dangerous behaviors. So one of the things we've uh, noticed is that people with high A score are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior, um, such as getting into fights, 
uh, uh, running running from somebody, running from the police, um, uh, engaging in activities where they they need they they feel desperate, so they need something like stealing. So essentially, there's a lot of cultural judgments associated with folks that have high A scores. So let's talk about that. Um, so here's another thing. So this is huge, which is now we know this isn't just correlating with all these diseases and problems. It's actually changing your brain. There are MRI results in the amygdala that show this. It inhibits your prefrontal cortex, which is the critical area for learning, vital impulse control and executive function. So we wonder why these kids come into school and have all these problems learning and sitting still and um, retaining information. Well, if they're from a home where they're likely to have a high A score, they can't learn. And then we get upset at them and say, why can't you pay attention? Why can't you do this? Here, take this, take this drug, right? Um, or maybe go to the office because you can't learn. We don't have the classroom. We don't have the setup to serve these children. Um, this doesn't exist unless I don't, maybe it does. I don't, I'm not aware of it in schools. Um, so this is very important if we're talking about family and environmental participation that we work on as communities, whatever your role is in healthcare, whatever you are as a therapist or a clinician person or a nonprofit uh, or whatever you are, where is our early intervention programs? That is going to help us as a society um, negate some of these early childhood experiences because people that grow up with high A scores are, if you think about it, they're not being treated till later in life. And this can cause all sorts of hurt and pain in their lives. But not only that, but as a society, our healthcare system which is reactionary, is now paying for all of that. And all these resources are, are going towards these uh, people that have had these adverse child experiences was not addressed early on, and therefore they've got massive health problems. And that's hurting the entire society. Um, and it's also hurting in lost uh, wages, lost opportunity, lost workforce, and a healthy society. Um, so I'm going to get in a little bit more into what chronic toxic stresses. I think I've kind of covered this, so I might move a little bit faster. But this is a very important point for this conference because we're talking about sustainable recovery in the environment and the family. So I'm going to start shifting to that. Uh, the environment a child grows up in is so important. It, it uh, developed, the, the environment affects the development that can mean psychosocial characteristics of the person. Um, what is going on in the home, the family, overcrowding, noise level, or neighborhood quality, relationship with parents, all these things affect their brain growing up. And this is why family and community engagement, either in treatment systems that we may be in or other community groups are so vital if somebody's experienced trauma or is experiencing trauma to be able to recover for that, from that. And we're going to get into studies on that. So the environment of the home and the neighborhood are just huge. Um, but essentially... There are so many studies that say we need a, a holistic approach. We can't just piecemeal this out, right? The kid goes to the doctor for IBS, IBS often associated with anxiety. Then they go to the psychiatrist because they have ADHD. Then they go to the therapist because their parents are getting divorced. Then they get sent to the uh, emotionally impaired classroom because they're stressed out. And then they get involved with the police because they start acting out. So we're piecemealing this with all of our systems and spending millions of dollars instead of working on cities and neighborhoods that can address the holistic needs collectively. And that's, that's a big task to ask to change because our society is big on independence uh, and, you know, having whatever you want uh, and not really collectively coming together. But we know this um, would change because it, people often want to blame bad genes. Well, it's nature and nurture. All the people in this presentation have the genetic markers that could be turned on or off with epigenetics based on what happens to you. And we know this, that the early years of childhood affect educational achievement, physical well-being, and employment opportunities in the future. So we have to really focus on that. So we were born with a set of genes that can be turned on and off depending on what's happening in the environment. In simple words, the environment influences our genes or gene expression. 
So as I said just a moment ago, we we're wondering what epigenetics is. And we still are in the beginning of learning that. But if any of you've taken the uh, 23andMe DNA test or whatever, you can see you have all these markers for different diseases or not having those markers or the marker for baldness, which is a fun one for my friends and I. But these things can, some of them can be switched on and off based on stressors, especially stressors, right? Um, and we're still learning that, but we know that there's at least a correlation with negative disease-based genes being turned on when we're stressed out for a long time with chronic toxic stress or long-term trauma in the environment. So how do we change all this? Well, relational health is key. Um, this is the positive part of the presentation. Family and community are huge. Those natural supports are so important. So the capacity to develop and sustain safe, stable, and nurturing relationships, which in turn prevents the extreme and prolonged activations of the body's stress response systems. How can we help children and families feel safe in their communities and their homes? Relational health refers to the interpersonal interactions that are growth fostering or mutually empathetic and empowering. And we're going to get into why that's important. So how do we decrease ACE scores? And how do we decrease this for sustainable recovery post-trauma? People need connection to community. They need connection to a, a family, even if it's not their blood family, a some type of family and a healthy social network because those, those relationships help with safety, stability, nurturing, and we grow together. Um, environmental stressors, community-related sources of stress that can prevent all the things I just said on the previous slide from happening. Um, Basically, essentially, these are things that lead to risk factors of higher levels of social vulnerability and lower levels of community resilience. So poverty and accompanying household economic stressors, unemployment, housing instability, food insecurity, lack of connection to relatives or other members of the community. We cannot control everyone's lives, okay? But as practitioners who have brains and can write letters, we need to be thinking about what social policies are being put into place because we are really just cleaning up the streets and the, and the community with people who are coming into our offices because of multiple environmental traumas and then bad things happen psychologically, right? And then we know that. And then bad things happen physically, right? And so we are sometimes feeling helpless. Now we are doing good because if we can help them and we can get them back into their community, which I'll get to, we can get their natural supports and we can help them over, you know, overcome some of the trauma and get into a more resilient state of mind or a post-traumatic growth. Well, then they can go back into their community and they can help others, right? And become part of that positive web. But when you have this negative effect in a certain area, it spreads, the stress spreads. The, all of these things that impact safety spread. And thus, we're going to get more problems and have lots of kids and families coming into therapy or worse, getting arrested. Uh, resiliency is the capacity to endure and thrive despite diversity. It's an evolving concept. We still don't really know everything about it. We believe it has to do with neuroplasticity and recovery, right? And as we know from Dr. Dan Siegel and Dr. Bruce Perry, neurons that wire together, fire together. So if a bad thing happens and then a positive thing happens and the person overcomes the bad thing, right? Such as poverty or something like that, they're going to have this sense that they can do it, right? And that's going to keep them in a resilient state of mind. How is this related to community resources? Well, resilience is highly dependent on multiple factors of an emotionally and physically supportive home environment for children. And that's difficult because we can't really go into homes and do that unless we have home-based services, which is very underfunded from what I understand. And we want to use a strength-based and strength-focused perspective uh, in therapy. We want to focus on not only what's going wrong and let's, get, let's work on reducing that, but what's going right and let's increase that, right? Not just the focus on the negative. So if somebody's resilient, they can increase more with their uh, family post-trauma. They can have a redefined or increased sense of purpose. They can have increased commitment to personal mission. Sometimes, you know, traumas happen to everybody, but sometimes there's positive effects that happen after the trauma, right? We can, we can see the world differently. We might have revised priorities. If a trauma happens to me, like a celebrity, right? They start giving more money to those organizations that support that. 
And there's a lot of positive things we can make it uh, help create resilient people and create resilient communities through whatever our role is. But without the positive examples in our communities and without interventions from therapists, these responses are less likely to occur in children because they are looking to their parents and they are looking to what's going on in their neighborhood. And if they don't see that, they're going to start believing that there is no hope, right? Um, this is huge. Children are constantly absorbing their parents' actions and not necessarily their lectures. Um, they're absorbing the atmosphere. So as clinicians, we can't fall into the trap of you know, aligning only with the parents and talking about how bad their children are behaving and blaming the children for what's going on in the family system. Um, I'm going to go through this really quickly because I don't want to miss uh, the ending that's positive. But here's the understanding of, of if you want to make your clinic trauma-informed or your practice trauma-informed paradigm, it's not just this presentation. There's a lot more you probably need to learn. But we need to understand biologically, so a lot of science there uh, and looking into those resources, and behavioral foundations of human adaptation to environmental stressors. So what's going on? How do we adapt to these problems and trauma, Right. So some of our body's good work is it does the fight, flight, freeze, fall and collapse, but then it becomes bad, right? If it keeps going further, it can become negative towards symptoms. It can, it can be disruptive. We have to be able to view trauma through an ecological and cultural lens. We have to be able to see that just because I responded resiliently to trauma and I went to grad school and I got a, a graduate degree and I can see things differently now, doesn't mean that everyone else has the same viewpoint. I have to see what do they see? How are they experiencing it? What's important to them? I have to see them through a culturally competent lens and that is holistic and looks at the whole of the environment that they're in and not impose my belief systems and simple quick fixes onto them. That's called projection. Um, we have to be able to understand context of perceiving and processing traumas. Just because somebody is traumatized by something that doesn't traumatize you doesn't mean it's invalid, okay? We have to learn to be more open than we are. Create an environment that's predictable, nurturing, and regulating. Well, we can at least do that in our clinics, right? We can at least work on, I don't know. I mean, this, is an, this, is, this might seem silly, but let's just go to some like really uh, dark, awful looking clinic and that only takes Medicaid. And you, you walk in there and the chairs are falling apart and it's dirty and the art on the wall is awful. Like, let's just start there, right? And what kind of magazines do you have in the office? And what's the, what's the temperature? And do you have water for people? There's so many things you can start with, plus your therapy office right there. And, and, and bringing that person into the safe environment and not judging them. Um, we have to be able to address the root causes of the toxic stress and childhood adversity and to build community resilience. We can't change the person's circumstances, but we can try to empower them to change instead of seeing them as a screwed up person, right? We have to see why are they making these poor choices? Why do they have these behaviors? Why do they have these symptoms, right? We need to look deeper. Um, we, there's a lot more research if you want to get into this uh, with Dr. Bruce, uh, McEwen of Rockefeller University, Dr. Psychiatrist and Neurologist Bruce Perry, Child Trauma Academy, if you want to look up their stuff, and Developing Children at Harvard.edu. Um, we found out, uh, the parallel study was found in kids' brains, that toxic stress damages the structure and function of the developing brain. So, I mean, this is just proven by science. So that is why it's important, because if we don't have early intervention, um, then these folks are going to grow up uh, with brains that are different than the brain maybe you grew up with. Um, and that's difficult because then it's difficult to relate to them and it's hard to help them. Um, essentially, uh, I think I already talked about this, but uh, children who are overloaded with stress hormones might be in fight, flight, freeze mode. They can't learn well in school. They have difficulty trusting adults, making healthy friendships. Um, they might move to drugs and alcohol, right? They might move to that to make themselves feel better, high-risk sports, sex partners, uh, or they might overwork. All of these things can be seen as a, a body or a, a person's nervous system attempting to adapt to the traumatic situation they're in. Okay. So, uh, I mean, it's why it's important for us not to judge people that use cigarettes and um, 
drugs, right? Because we know that they may be doing this as the beginning to calm themselves or to have fun, but then eventually it becomes an addiction and it, this leads to disease. Um, also, we are still learning about this, but there's toxic stress and trauma can be passed down from generation to generation. There's lots of rat studies on that. We're still learning about how that works in humans. Uh, we already talked about epigenetics. So let's talk about the building community resilience model. Uh, the purpose of this model is to foster collabor collaboration across child health systems, community-based organizations, and cross-sector partners to address the root causes of toxic stress and childhood diversity. So here's the deal. I don't know many therapists that have time for this, but I guess this would be targeted more at the people running the organizations you work for, right? And or if you have any political connections. How do we foster a program in Michigan or wherever we are living that has people in charge that know what trauma is and know how to build resilient communities? And then how do we then bring those values into uh, CPS, child welfare systems? How do we bring them into our community organizations that work with the people that are having the most trouble? And how do we bring those into people that possibly have money and insurance to uh, get help? How do we bring these values into here to, to partner to be able to make preventative programs so we're not always just cleaning up the mess? You know, that, that's a big, that's a top level issue. How do we help reduce stressors within the family and community that contribute to childhood adversity? Well, as therapists, we have to work one-on-one -on -one or with the family to try to work on ways that they can do it, right? But perhaps there's presentations we can do in the community. Perhaps there's ways to get the school district involved to promote education to help families, right? Uh, to redesign and align social uh, health and social service delivery systems to improve the fabric of communities. So how do we get them working together? How do we collaborate? How do we move beyond? I mean, I've thought about this. We're overloaded with clients, overloaded clients coming in every day. How do we reach more people? Is it group therapy? Is it educational lectures? Who's got time for that, right? How do we, how do we get uh, the message into the community of empowerment? And then really, uh, eventually, how do we work on our systems as a country, as a state, to, to be able to foster a resilient community for everybody involved? And that's a bigger political issue. Uh, four components of building communities uh, resilience, shared and understanding of childhood and community adversity. So if we don't have a shared understanding of what childhood is, what community adversity is, we're going to have all these arguments. We're going to say, well, it's just because they aren't, um, you know, these kids break the rules too much. They need to know what the rules are about, you know, or um, I don't know. It's because nobody goes to church anymore, or um, I don't know. They're just bad people. They just use drugs. They're just trash, right? These are the judgments you hear in the community all the time, okay? It's ridiculous, and it's wrong, and it's short-sighted, and it's black and white thinking, and it's ignorant. So we need to understand what shapes people, what shapes their childhood, what shapes community adversity. We have to be able to figure out, is our clinic ready? Do we have the education to our clinicians? Do we have the education at the CEO level, right? Do we have, do we have a good leadership model? Um, how do we develop cross-sector partnerships with mentoring organizations, with Boys and Girls Club? With, uh, how do we help programs that go into the schools and work for behavioral coaching? My friend in Arizona, he he runs a program now, and he runs it all with interns who are bachelor's level social workers uh, at, at universities nearby. And he has like 15 mentors come into, this, come into the school every week and do about three to four hours with kids who have behavioral problems. And they take these kids in little groups and individually, and they just coach them on behavior and they empower them. And this school's um, truancy records and their... Um, their problem with kids getting in trouble with the police and with uh, the principals has dropped so far. It's unbelievable. And in fact, some of the kids from the alternative school have come back to his school because of this little program he developed where he brought in these volunteers that needed hours for their bachelor's degree to coach kids on behavior. That simple, not even master's level. How do we engage families and residents in a collaborative response to prevent and address the pair of ACEs. And how do we understand why, why did I spend so much time on ACEs? Because it's so important to understanding. Um, and I honestly feel like it took me a while to learn, learn it through different presentations, how much it affects the entire lifespan. We have to stop shaming, blaming, or cultural scapegoating. And this means that in your clinic, 
if you hear people, I mean, I'm fine with venting. Trust me. I like the clinicians to vet when there's a clinician, a client that bothers them and we can all pull our hair out and stuff together. But if we start othering them and saying, oh, it's because they're this, or they vote like this, or because of this, and they don't know how to manage their money, and we just start like blaming them, then we're contributing to the problem. Um, so this is one of the biggest concepts here about this building community resilience portion is children can become resilient and they can overcome stress and trauma if they live in communities where adults are resilient. How many times do you have a child or a teenager in therapy and you go, oh my God, this isn't their, this isn't their issue. This is a family system issue, but the parents are so busy and so overworked and they're both working and they don't make enough money that they don't even have time to come into therapy, let alone consider what you're talking about. How do we help adults become resilient? Um, the strategy is aimed at preventing or reducing stressors within the community that contribute to childhood adversity. So how do we help, you know, people find alternatives to substances? How do we help people become resilient as a community? That's a big question. I think education is part of it, but there's bigger things at play. Uh, so what are some barriers? What are local policies or issues that are affecting adults in your community? So uh, I'll open it up just for a minute, about two minutes. Are there any policies or issues uh, in your community that you think are affecting adults negatively that are causing people to become less resilient and more prone to trauma and stress? Anybody want to come in on that? I hear something far away in the distance. You check online. Oh, okay. I don't see anything in the chat either. Okay. Well, I'm, I've got examples, so that's fine. Let's just go with that unless somebody interrupts me. Um, so here's one. Uh, I have friends that write for newspapers. Uh, economists say the middle class is disappearing and the billionaires are getting richer while the poor are getting poorer. How might this affect people in your community with stress? and other issues. So I'm just going to tell you right now, housing is a huge issue. Housing prices are up for whatever reason, and people are having to spend more and more money on rent, which they have no ownership of the space that they're living in, and they uh, have very few rights, and therefore they have less money to spend on food or leisure or things that might reduce their stress. They don't have money to spend on yoga classes, okay? They don't have money to spend on going to get a massage. They don't have money, uh, and so where do they where do they get their help? Um, more stress building up can become toxic chronic stress. It's easier to go to the gas station and buy a twelve pack of Miller Lite for like six dollars, and then you feel good for an evening, right? But there's a long term buildup for that. Does your community have nonprofits and organizations that work towards empowering an adults to, and children to succeed, or do they create a dependence model? of helping and, or toxic nonprofits, which help assuage the guilt of philanthropists without addressing the root causes of the sociological issues. I mean, I hate to say this, but I see that all over the place, in my own opinion, um, where we have this dependence model and, uh, and uh, good, well-meaning people, very well-meaning people run these nonprofits, and they have created a model that supports somebody feeling like a victim and feeling like a bad sinner, and they have to come get their bread from this place. Um, education costs after high school are skyrocketing, uh, payday loan companies take advantage of those living paycheck to paycheck. When you don't have safety, which means you have, you know, and in our country, in a capitalist society means you don't have money, means you don't have safety. And therefore this is stress. This is going to cause non-resilient adults, stressed out adults, create stressed out children. Then we see that in our schools. We see that in our counseling office. Uh, we don't want to reinforce a negative narrative of those who are suffering. But as I've said before, we see these problem children, right? We, uh, who may be suffering from chronic toxic stress. Uh, we rely on baseless cultural tropes for classroom management and assumptions. Many schools lack the resources and funding to implement programs or have staff available to care for the emotional needs of students. I found out, and I don't have the stats here, but I found out in an article, Michigan has the least amount of school counselors per student, I believe of any state in the United States. What in the world is that? It's, it's insane. You can look that up. The criminal justice system is horrendous. It believes that punishment of drug users work. There's no scientific evidence for that. 
I mean, yes, getting rock bottom and you make the choice changes you, but punishing does not. So we don't offer rehabilitation of almost any kind inside of jail. The only thing I've heard of is in juvenile detention, we have group therapy. Um, and there's a few small programs in Michigan where they do some sort of military thing where they make people march and like fold their laundry and read books here and there. But overall, the criminal justice system has people sits in uh, cells and they sit there and rot and watch television and they don't learn about how to come out and be citizens and learn any emotional coping skills. Um, For-profit prisons are even worse because they definitely don't offer any rehab or treatment. The only thing I've seen is volunteers from you know, like churches and nonprofits going in and talking to prisoners. Um, so that can reinforce So when people come out of jail, then we have even less resilient adults coming out of jail back into the community where they're not connected and then reoffending, thus impacting our community. Um, some religious institutions seek to enforce moral codes using fear, shame, and guilt and focusing on certain scriptures to uphold power while ignoring others that call for shared power. We see that oftentimes in our clinic, people come in from bad experiences in certain religious institutions um, and feeling like a bad person and thus they act badly. Uh, judgment, cultural narratives in the general public, news media, stereotypes. Um, if you've ever uh, deconstructed the show Cops, there's an Ameri This American Life episode that deconstructs the entire show and you find out that half of the things on the show and the officers arrest them are later dropped because they signed a waiver. The, people's, um, the people are signed the waiver under duress. Uh, then their face is broadcast out there, causing even more trauma, even if they weren't even convicted for that crime. Um, and you can read about that reality show. Uh, therapists and social workers who are not trauma-informed deliver their own cultural judgments upon clients, especially difficult or resistance ones. They uh, freely give their opinions or judgments upon crime, uh, patients' behavior, telling them just stop it, stop smoking, stop drinking, stop it, stop thinking about the abuse, think of something better, look at your life now. These are things I've actually heard. I don't want to depress you too much, but these are things that clients have told me. A client told me, don't think about your trauma anymore, that their therapist said that. Uh, another client told me, if you just forgive that person, you'll stop being angry about what he did to you. Another ther client told me, a therapist told them, God gave us a brain. This means you need to use it or lose it. You need to think about the consequences so that you stop doing all that bad stuff. These are things I wrote down. Somebody told me that the therapist said, just say no to drugs. Somebody told me the therapist said, it seems like you aren't working hard enough in therapy. Somebody told me their therapist said, I wonder if you really want to get better. Uh, somebody told me this, uh, well, I've done all I can in for you. You're probably going to have to keep repeating the coping skills you learned or stay on medications for the rest of your life. And a, a, a male told me this actually very recently that his therapist said, you need to man up and take responsibility. So that's depressing, but we can help by, you know, for supervisors, by helping our therapists become uh, trauma informed ways to help the family prevent lasting effects of trauma. We need to engage and empower the adults and parents because that's vital for buffering children from toxic stressors that exist. We need to build strong relationships between parents and children. That means family therapy is very important because we've seen that this can reduce um, the effects from the ACE scores. Connections to healthy people is an antidote for stress. Encouraging our clients to get out there and get mentorship. Uh, research has shown that just one positive adult can dramatically improve the outlook for suffering children from the adverse child experiences um, score. So one positive adult can drastically improve the outlook for somebody suffering from trauma. Huge. Family engagement is majorly important. Um, we've learned about the long-term effects. I've talked about that ad nauseum, but it's important to get this concept. Uh, if you're connected in a healthy way to family or community, and, and doesn't have to be your blood family, but a family, you can have a lot of adversity and you can recover and even thrive without therapy. We want to work on connectedness. We want to promote healthy families and vital communities. Connection is so important in therapy as well, working on our connection to our clients. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much, but this there are ways to deal with people that have been through trauma and help them in therapy, like family therapy, EMDR therapy, trauma-focused CBT support groups in the community, trauma-informed counseling internal family systems and ego state therapies, they focus on bringing up the traumatic memory to integrate them uh, and help the person. Uh, prevention, we want to work on um, relational connectedness, 
We want to help them learn positive communication skills. We want to learn help uh, people in the family learn emotional vulnerability and authenticity. We want um, we want trauma informed practices with our families. We want to bring those families in, even if they're annoying. Bring the parents in, bring the uncles in, bring people into family therapy. It's very important for children and everyone. Um, as a counselor, we need to get comfortable with uh, distress in order to listen to these emotionally intense stories, um, get educated on the trauma-informed paradigm of counseling, learn about polyvagal theory, learn about Dr. Bruce Perry, and understand the intersection of environmental stress and trauma on the family and, of course, children. Get educated in a trauma-specific modality um, that we've talked about before so you know how to actually treat it in your office, right? Uh, get connected to community organizations that you can refer to families to. So one of the things that I've always stressed to all my therapists who work for me is we are not the one-stop shop for everything. After you've established rapport and you've started making some progress with the client, start interjecting and finding ways for them to get connected to either natural or community supports because that takes some of the pressure off us for their recovery, right? And that's what the literature says works. Stop pathologizing children independent of the family system. I can't believe I'm still having to say this in 2022. Hopefully nobody out there is offended, but I'm offended constantly from the stories I hear about therapists and clinics pathologizing children and schools pathologizing children without looking at the family system. I mean, I want to, we'll just go there. It just popped in my head. The school shooter in Oxford, Michigan, you know, this kid obviously did a terrible thing, but his parents bought him the gun. His parents took him to the shooting range. His parents did not listen to his cries for help and they didn't get him into therapy and they didn't restrict, you know, as they should have. And look what happened. So it's the, it's the whole system there that's involved. Dealing with the environmental trauma as the therapist, uh, we need to create a uh, safe environment. We need to feel safe. Work on yourself. Um, how can you increase your psychological well-being, right? How can we feel good? Um, and as the World Health Organization has said, um, for self-care, one of the key elements of beginning self-care is having a supportive and safe environment. And so how do we have that in our home or our apartment and so that we can bring that into the office, right? Uh, Self-care begins with our nervous system. Therapists uh, need to be present, attentive, attuned, and responsive. And you can't be that way if you yourself are struggling from environmental stressors, right? Running to Dairy Queen and getting an ice cream cone and eating it on your way home is not self-care, right? Me getting a quad shot latte because I haven't slept is not self-care, right? How do we care for ourselves and then become good examples to teach our clients? How do we walk the walk and not talk the talk and not just talk the talk? How do we identify and ask what happened to you? How did you get here? Instead of let's, um, let's, you know, ask what's wrong with you. So how many people have, have, have seen a kid acting out? What's wrong with you? Why'd you do that? Right. Instead of what happened to you? How did you get here? How did you end up in my office? I used to work with kids that got arrested all the time um, on the west side of Phoenix. And, I, and, and it, you know, everyone would say, what's wrong with this kid? And I, it's not that. It's like, what, what, ins I would I'd ask the kid, you know, once we calmed down and I'd go visit them in jail, I'd say something like, all right, like, just kind of curious. Um, how did, how did this come about that you were riding in a car with drugs in it? Just kind of curious. And they'd tell me the story. And it always started that morning or the weekend before when their mom or dad cussed them out and told them they were just like, whatever. And they started feeling crappy. And so then they found out their, their friend had drugs and they wanted to go help them sell it. And then the rest is history. Then they're in jail. Um, question one, what happened to you? How did you get here? Is curious, empathetic, and educational. Question two is judgmental. What's wrong with you? Judgmental, accusatory, and ignorant of human behaviors and their causes. As therapists, we cannot be looking at only one paradigm. We cannot just be behaviorists. We have to be educated about human behavior and their causes, not just looking at behaviors. Therapy needs to be a holistic intervention model. Um, care coordination with the work, schools, doctors, et cetera, home visits. Um, oh my God, if we could get funding for home visits, so important. How do we get um, people into mental health care that need it in terms of the right level of care? 
uh, is it outpatient therapy or do they need intensive outpatient, right? Something higher. How do we help our clinics with nutritional education? How do we get that into there? Because that impacts the nervous system as well. Medication when necessary. What I, what I see here is that kids are very over-medicated and adults are under-medicated. Anyway, um, educating parents about the impact of ACEs. Um, know your role. What do you have the ability to do? We cannot solve all the problems in the world, right? We only have so many hours in a day. We only have so much power. We only have so much influence. What is it that you can do to start living this, to have a regulated nervous system, to create a safe place, to start educating your workmates, to start um, working on the thing that you're good at, right? If you can't do a certain invention, can you provide thoughtful resources? Yes, you can. You know, a lot of therapists in my office have developed little worksheets and things that will give to clients like online resources, like free meditation apps, um, learning how to self-regulate um, videos, things like that. There's lots of education out there now that there wasn't even 10 years ago on YouTube even. In addition to regular therapeutic interventions, therapists should focus on um, increasing community engagement with the person. What are they doing with their relationships? Um, enhancing resilience. How do we how do we do that just outside of the regular therapy? For therapists, it's important to know the polyvagal model of the nervous system and its connection with the ACEs history. I'm not going to go into all that because I don't have enough time to address all that. I only have about eight minutes left. Uh, so I don't want to go into that too much, but polyvagal goes way beyond the uh, regular fight flight information and freeze that you've learned about. And uh, it goes into how to understand that and its effects in the nervous system. So I would, I would encourage you all to learn about the polyvagal theory. Um, social engagement theory uh, is uh, how to basically decrease defensive responses in people and connect with them better. And you have to be able to do that by learning are they in fight, flight, freeze, fawn, or collapse in my office? Are people just trying to please you? Are they feeling shut down? How do we help them knowing polyvagal? Um, essentially, um, how do we, what do we do with our clients when they're defensive? If you know polyvagal theory, you can help educate the person about where they are in their state. You can help bring them down. You can do exercises to do that. Uh, it's not too hard to learn about it. Honestly, it's pretty easy. It just requires some experience. Um, sustainable recovery. It's long-term psychological and physical well-being after experiencing adversities. We all have adversity. We can't grow up without it. Uh, and it ha can have very serious effects. But sustainable recovery, which is what we're going for here, a sustainable recovery helps us maintain healthy patterns of brain activity. And that requires more than just therapy. It requires community connection. And um, how do we start getting people skills for self-regulation and self-care? in both service providers and clients, very important for resilience. So, you know, the polyvagal theory, learning um, mindfulness skills, um, learning a specific trauma specific modality, practicing that with clients. Uh, we need to go deeper and pull out the roots of trauma instead of just coping with symptoms. So at the beginning, yes, we need to work on symptoms, but eventually let's go to the roots and what types of therapies are gonna help with that. And getting the family system involved is huge. Um, so, in any role, we want to promote integrated care. We want to uh, promote, are they going to their primary care doctor? Are they learning about preventative medicine? Are they involved in any activities? Uh, does the family have any activities or connections that are healthy? Um, are they involved in mental health interventions? And is are any of your clients involved in fitness? And I mean that by just even hiking or walking can help regulate the nervous system. Um, so essentially, we need for the family, we have to be able to educate the family about what reactions are to trauma and what that looks like. Um, and that includes all members of the family, if we can understand the effects on family dynamics and how trauma impacts that. And all, also helpful strategies for recovery, such as the things we've just talked about, such as therapy and community engagement. Uh, connectedness and post-traumatic wisdom are the two elements of sustainable recovery according to the research. 
connectedness is that humans were intended to live in groups or communities. Um, we are known as pod mammals, and we're very similar to dolphins and other small groups of mammals. Uh, we feel better in a group. Now, <laughs> if, if you're in a group of people that are really mean and toxic, quote unquote, you're not going to feel better. So we have to try to promote that positive group. Um, it's a personal journey and recovery is done much better around family members or people that are caring and you feel belonging to. Uh, we need to work on reward of reg and regulation as the way to heal from trauma is dependent of a lot upon our friendships. We're almost there. Post-traumatic wisdom. Uh, it's referring to the experience where you've been able to get through adversity and now you're at a new safe place in your life and can look back and reflect. That is awesome. This term was partially coined by Dr. Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey. They have a new book out, which I recommend. In simple words, Oprah said, it is taking the pain and turning it into power, but that takes time. You have to get past the traumatic feeling first. Um, you can't change what's happened to you, but you can recognize how they shaped your life and that, what impact it had on your life. But you can't do that if you're currently surrounded by people that are not helpful. You can't do that in an unsafe environment. And that includes your therapist office or your neighborhood. So post-traumatic growth uh, is into positive psychology. It's similar to resilience. Um, it's a positive psychological change. It's an upward spiral. Here's the five factors of it, which are relating to others with greater compassion, finding new possibilities, personal strength, spiritual change, and a deeper appreciation for life. And that can happen if you are able to process a trauma and get through it together with other people. Um, neurobiology, I'm not going to go into this too much, but if you don't know what neurobiology is, please start reading about it. Dr. Dan Siegel has the guide to interpersonal neurobiology. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of this evidence has only emerged in the last 20 years. Uh, and so we need to learn about how the entire nervous system is affected. Um, we've already kind of talked about this. We don't want to shame or label people. And over the long term, we need to work on safety so that people don't internalize everything. Outside of therapy, we need to encourage involvement. Work on small goals of helping your clients and family engage in various types of community organizations or social groups that could help fill in the gaps. Slowly but surely, if there are positive natural supports, this may lead to more long-term resilience and recovery. And we don't see people coming back into treatment, back into treatment, back into treatment. Are you ready to be trauma-informed? In general, you can only lead people on the journey as far as you've gone. Transformed people transform people. When you can be healed yourself and not just talk about healing, you are, as Henri Nouan said, a wounded healer. And Richard Rohr said that, and I really do believe that. I believe we have to be doing our own work. Are we doing our own therapy? Are we in therapy? Are we working on our relationships in our community? Or are we just telling others to do that? I think that's our role as a therapist. Okay. <laughs> Come on. It's being silly now. Okay. So additional resources, uh, look up the adolescent community reinforcement approach. If you work with teens and substance, very good resource. Look up the trauma-informed uh, paradigm and it's 16 principles. There's a link in the notes for that. I'm not going to go through all the trauma-informed things, but it, it is really about uh, shared power, trust, diversity, safety, um, communication, pursuing that person's strengths, what they want, and understanding trauma. Additional resources are the attachment theory and circle of security. The neurosequential model is huge from the Child Trauma Academy. Uh, a good book, if you just want a quick read, honestly, you could read this book in about three days. It's called What Happened to You? Conversations on Trauma, Resilience, and Healing by Dr. Bruce Perry and uh, Oprah Winfrey. They summarize a lot of the research I've been talking about in a much more quick and eloquent way, but it, it, uh, it's a good starter. If you want to buy people books for the holidays, that's a good one. Um, additional resources, learn about EMDR therapy, very useful. Uh, I won't go into all of that. Um, learn about the Fife model, feelings, ideas, function, expectation. It's a Canadian practice that a lot of uh, doctors have been utilizing for a more integrated treatment model. I know I have about two minutes left. Um, so I'm going to open up to questions. So if you want more from me, I do have a podcast called the intentional clinician podcast. It's on all the platforms you can find. Um, and you can hear me talk with guests and people I interview and things like that. And our website, healthforlifegr.com uh, has about a hundred blogs and we're, or maybe 150 blogs about mental health. You can read. I have so many pages of references that it's going to take five minutes to go through. 
So um, any questions in the last two or three minutes? Anybody want to ask a question or anything else? Any questions from our live audience? I didn't see anything on, uh, on Zoom. And just a reminder for everyone, uh, Paul is going to be sharing these slides so you will have access to all of this uh, great resource information. Yes, and um, we'd love to partner with you at Health for Life Counseling. Uh, you can contact me. Um, I'm always looking for opportunities that are sustainable to partner with other organizations. We partnered a lot with Sanford Addiction Centers in the past, um, and it's been a great partnership so far. And we've partnered with uh, Newport Academy, and I would love to be able to, and we partner with Forest Hill Schools. So I would love to partner with your organization, just to, even if it's just that we're referring back and forth or um, sharing information or resources. Um, so feel free to contact me as well. And there's our website. If you want to look at our blog, which has hundreds of blogs on there about mental health, and we're publishing about two or three a month right now for the community that are free information. Um, I'm going to publish all these slides. Um, there are going to be a link for you to download. Any other questions from the audience? No, I think we're all set. Thank you so much for um, coming here today, Paul. We really appreciate it. Um, for anyone who is online, uh, we do have one more, our last uh, one left by Lawrence T. Wentworth, um, which he's going over an overview of internal family systems uh, model and demonstration of how to handle a suicidal client. So uh, pop on that next one. It'll be at 320. Thank you again, Paul. Thank you, everybody.